a great Savior. We thank you for being the hearer of our prayers, the activator of grace in our life. And I pray for those that have been mentioned tonight. Lord, only you can move into these lives and do what needs to be done. We might not even know what, uh, what needs to be done, but you do. And I pray we just we release you to would you act in their lives in such a way that they would just absolutely praise you and honor you. And I ask you to bless our study tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. When a president gets elected, normally here in the United States, they have an inaugural address. Inaugural means first. So when Jesus came into the world, he, uh, he was baptized at age 30, which we're in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16. And so Christ was introduced by John the Baptist as the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. And he baptized him, not because he was lost and needed to be baptized uh, to, you know, put him into the New Testament church. That's what baptism is for us. He baptized him because, you remember Jesus said, they kind of got in a little, John got in a disagreement with him. You remember? No, 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 no. You, I need to be baptized. You said, no, you baptize me because it needs to fulfill righteousness. In the Old Testament, a priest was introduced into his priesthood uh, from the family of Aaron, and he got his inaugural introduction into the priesthood at age 30. The priest would take him to the the, the big, the, the big uh, lever, the big, uh, and it had hundreds of gallons of water in it, and they would wash him all over from head to toe. They'd do that one time. They would never have to do that again. And he had to retire at age 50. So he had two decades to do his work. So when Jesus was introduced as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world, he was introduced into his priestly office with this once for all bath, which he never had to have again. And uh, then in, in Matthew 5, what he does, he explains what is normative in the kingdom of heaven. Right, in other words, we here in the United States, what, we know what normal behavior is on the highway in Walmart. You know, there are just certain things you do. You don't scream and holler. You don't do that. Uh, there's, a, there's a culture in this country that's unique to America. And, and, of course, we've got rules and laws and things like that. Um, and so what Jesus comes to do, he says, you have been living in a culture that has a completely different set of rules. I am about to introduce to you the rules of the kingdom of heaven. You've never seen anything like this. And they hadn't. This was a shocking thing to them uh, when they were hearing because what it did, it, it just absolutely penetrated their hypocrisy. It was, it was pretty common to be a hypocrite in Jewish circles. And a hypocrite is not a backslidden Christian. Hypocritos is a combination of two Greek words that means hypo, kritos, meant to act from behind a mask. And so if you were in the Greek theater and you were a, a guy and you needed to play the part of a lion, well, they didn't have special effects like we do today. What you would do, you would pick up a lion's mask. And you would roar and you would play the part of a lion. Now, were you a lion? You weren't a lion. What did you want people to think you were? A lion. So what is a hypocritos? Well, a hypocritos was an actor that played the part of something he wasn't. So we use the word hypocrite now in our culture. It is not a backslidden Christian. It is a lost man that wants you to think he's a Christian. So... Jesus is going to address this issue of actual righteousness. How does an actual believer in Jesus Christ behave? What's normal? I read a book years ago by Watchman Nee called The Normal Christian Life. And if you've never heard of it, um, I get a copy of it because when I was through, I was like, that's normal. Oh, wow. 
I was so abnormal then, you know, the way he was talking about the Christian life, it was, it was just magnificent. Anyway, in chapter 5, we're going to go down to uh, verse number 13. And when Jesus used analogies, they weren't random. He didn't say, you know, you guys are like uh, oak trees. You know, he didn't do that. When he used anything, comparing his people to any entity in the world, it was very precisely chosen. And there was a, there was a reason for choosing that particular thing. And uh, so he, what he did, well, for instance, in verse number uh, 13, says you're the salt of the earth. And we've covered this before. Uh, but salt, what, what do you mean we're the salt of the earth? That's a seasoning? Really? Exactly. Uh, because salt is a combination of two very deadly elements. Number one, sodium. Salt is sodium chloride. Sodium is a poisonous metal. It will kill you right now. Then there's chlorine. Chlorine is a poisonous gas. If a train has a wreck that's carrying uh, chlorine tanks and that, that green cloud, man, everybody gets out of Dodge because that stuff is deadly. But you can take two deadly things, sodium, and chlorine and combine them chemically and sprinkle them on your eggs. Isn't that amazing what God has done in that area? And so Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. And just very quickly, uh, salt does several things. Number one, it flavors. You people in here tonight, you have flavored your world. You make it taste better. You make it palatable. You make it more gracious, more, more kind, more of, of more godly, all right? That's, that's what you do as uh, salt. Then number two, it preserves. Some of y'all may remember, maybe your dad or granddad salting a big old ham and, you know, letting the salt pull the, pull the water out of it. And then when it's, when it's done, you bust off that salt casing with a hammer and you've got salt-cured ham. And so I just wonder how many extra decades the world has gotten because of the presence of you and Christians worldwide that we have preserved this, this earth. And then uh, the third thing, it stings an open wound. One thing you don't want to get in a cut is, is salt. It will sting the fire out of you. So what does that mean? This world is an open wound. And then when you come along with a testimony of, of God's goodness and His grace and His forgiveness, there are a lot of people that are just like, I don't want to hear that. I don't, you know. And so you're just like salt in the open wound of their life. And then number four, it creates thirst. You can eat something salty and you're just like, you know, you drink, I can eat shrimp and drink water for three days. It just, I guess the salt, saline content of the shrimp. And, um, but, you know, there's, there's the old wives' tale. You can drive a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Sure you can. Feed him salt. All you got to do, put a salt block out there. He'll lick that block. We had horses up in Kissimmee and, and we would do that. And after a little bit of working on that salt block, they'd throw their head up and their nostrils would be that big around. And you could hear them blowing out there, smelling. And, you know, I just sat back. I didn't have to make them drink water. All I did was feed them salt. And, boy, here they come, boogity, 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 run up the defense, stick your head down in the bucket, and drink and drink and drink. The point is this. If our life has a high saline content, you will create thirst for the water of life in the lives of other people. And so Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. Then he says in verse number 14, you're something else. Not only are you salt, but you're light. You're the light of the world. Now, when you, when you light a candle, guess where you don't put it? You don't put it under a bucket. You don't do that. You don't put it under the bed. What's the purpose of a light? To give light, right? So where is the most advent? Where are the lights in this building, might I add? They're not on the floor. They're in the highest possible place. In the book of Revelation, the candlestick is, the seven-branch candlestick, is a representation of the seven churches of Asia. And so the candlestick uh, held the candles. And so where is the highest possible place that a Christian can place his testimony and his life in a New Testament church? That's, that's the highest place. Now, light. We don't know a whole lot about light. We do know this. We do know that light is part of what is known as the electromagnetic spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum 
is a line. It's kind of like taking a water hose. Have you ever done this to a water hose? And it just waves like that. Um, all energy, all light and sound is part, and, and waves, those things are part of an electromagnetic spectrum that part of it can be seen, most of it cannot. Part of it can be heard, most of it cannot. Um, for instance, the human eye can detect a very small portion of this great big long line of energy. We can hear very little. Animals can hear what we can't hear. Animals can see what we can't see. I mean, they, uh, they have a much broader range of, of contact on this thing. For instance, the human eye can see on this, on this big wave from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. Now, that is not very much. When you consider that a nanometer is one billionth of an inch, or one billionth of a meter, rather, and a meter is 39 inches long. So you've got 39 inches. A nanometer is one billionth of 39 inches. All right, so we can, we can hear, or rather see, from 400 of these nanometers out to 700 of these nanometers on a 39-inch scale. Uh, 700 is toward the red end. So anybody got anything red on tonight? Uh, Lyle's got a red shirt on, and so your shirt is, is vibrating at about 700 nanometers. On the other end, the 400 nanometer end of this scale is um, violet, your sweater. Is, is more violet and so y'all are on opposite ends of the electromagnetic spectrum and then we've got everything in between you got your yellows and your blues and all that kind of stuff um, the fastest substance in the universe now keep in mind Jesus said you are the light so everything we're studying right now is true about light so this is what we are to be and uh, the fastest uni the thing in the universe that we know anything about is light. The vacuum speed of light. Light travels in a vacuum and outer space is practically a perfect vacuum. Now let me give you some figures that you will not understand because I don't understand them but here they are. Light travels at 299,792,458 meters per second. All right, now let's break that down. That translates to 186,822 miles per second. That translates down to 671 million miles an hour. That's pretty quick. Now, I'm glad that light doesn't move like we do. Could you imagine turning your flashlight on and light coming out just kind of like hard butter you know it, it's coming it you know you got your flash it's coming, there it coming. <laughs> it's it's like boom you turn it on and and it is there now uh light from the moon for instance which is what eighty-seven thousand miles away takes 1.3 seconds to get here so when you go out tonight and you look at the moon the moon when you see the moon that light left 1.3 seconds ago, and it is a continuous stream. And so because it is a continuous stream, it is a continual visual image. Now let's move back a little bit. I think the sun is 93 million miles from us here on the earth, and it takes 8.3 minutes. And so the light that you see that is, is burning your hands and, you know, making you wear sunglasses, that light is 8.3 minutes old because it had to go an incredible 93 million miles and it made that trip in eight seconds. That's pretty quick. Now, light from the nearest star, 4.24 years. Okay, now here's what we've got to do. 471 million miles in a second, or, or an hour rather, 471 million miles an hour. 
How many hours are in 4.24 years? I don't know. But here's what you do. You multiply 471 million miles an hour times 4.24 years, and that tells you how far that light has traveled. It, that, it, it's incredible. Now, to the nearest galaxy, we're a small little elliptical galaxy known as the Milky Way. Our little old Milky Way, we're, a, we're kind of a tiny little old thing, actually. And uh, from, from one city limit to the other, other city limit in the, in the Milky Way, light takes 100,000 years to get from one side to the other going 471 million miles an hour. Now, from the nearest galaxy that we can measure 2.5 million years to reach the earth. Now, light's pretty speedy. And Jesus said, you are the light of the world. I don't know about that. <laughs> I mean, I know it's true and I know it's biblical, but Budweiser can reach the nation in a 30-second commercial. How long does it take us to walk across the street and talk to our neighbor? You know, if, if we're the light of the world. Light has what's called dual specificity. We finally figured this out. There was a time when, when scientists did not believe this. In other words, people used to say, well, it's just a, it's a continual wave. And then there were scientists that said, no, no, it's particles. It's like a bunch of little BBs. Well, they finally figured out it's actually both. It is a continuous wave of BBs. And these little BBs are called photons. And a photon is the smallest unit of light that we know anything about right now. And the, the New Testament, in other words, this light right here is a wave coming down, striking our eyes, but it's, it's little BBs. It's a bunch of photons that are streaming out of those bulbs, striking our eyes one at a time, but you can't tell it's one at a time because there's a continual stream of light. So, light is made up of a bunch of individual particles. The New Testament church is made up of individual Christian photons. And that's what we are. We are carriers of light. Uh, I'm talking about each individual, I'm not just talking about the corporate unit of the church. You individually carry this responsibility of being a Christian photon to, uh, to the community and, and to your circle of friends, your circle of, of influence. And um, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 through 10 talks about how the Lord has shed His love abroad in our heart, which means that He has poured into our heart his brand of love or his kind of love now if somebody came in and they had on some strong perfume and they sit down and in just a few minutes you know if somebody sits in the middle of the of the section back there i can smell that now how did it get from back there to me it happens like this the air is full of individual molecules, right? Let's just say they're like little, little balloons. And these balloons are absorbent. And so the, the perfume gets to the ones that are closest to it. And they pass it on to the ones closest to them. It's not that that, that one molecule takes the, the fragrance and floats it up here to me. It doesn't work that way. It's handed off. To this one, to this one, to this one, to and pretty soon, the the ones in the area of of my nose absorb the fragrance from the ones behind it, and I'm like, boy, that smells good. So, how does the Lord get the gospel from point A to point B? 
individual molecules of believers absorb the truth, are, are changed by the truth. They don't wait for their church to do it. You understand? This is how the church does it. It is an individual transfer of the truth to, to, to where? Um, wherever you go. To you carry the gospel wherever you go. And we either seal it off and only talk about it when we get in this building, or we live these things so that people's lives are actually touched by what we say. And uh, so these light waves only appear visible in this, in this spectrum. Now, to give you an idea, there are all kinds, we'll just call it energy. There's all kinds of energy running through this building right now. I'll, I'll prove That wouldn't work if there were not waves of energy contacting my phone. Uh, there are radio waves running through this building right now. You know how I can prove that? Turn radio on. So I got to just turn the radio on. Yep. Something's going on between. You can't see it. You can't taste it. But it's it, it apparently is working, and uh, so these. Um, these waves, television waves, are running through this building right now. You know how we know that to be true? There are people home watching TV. Exactly, <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so we can we can find a device that will translate these waves into something visible and audible, folks. We are the instrument in this world that takes the truth of God's Word that is invisible, it's powerful than a two-edged sword, somehow some kind of an instrument needs to be found to translate that into behavior or action or visibility. Guess what God has chosen to do that through? Us, individual people. Now, if we had a prism, and that's uh, just a plastic pyramid-looking thing, and we took a flashlight, and a flashlight is white light. What we've got coming out of these bulbs is white light. However, the white light coming out of these bulbs is actually a combination of colors. When you mix them together, they disappear. Okay, you can put, uh, was it white and black paint together and it turns gray. And so you, you can get all kinds of colors by knowing how to mix these things. And so the Lord knew that we needed something that we couldn't see by which we could see. All right? Now, I say, well, how, how could we ever find what white light is made out of? And the Lord provided. Uh, a solution to that problem as well. We could take a flashlight and a prism. You flash or turn that flashlight on through that prism, what happens? It splits it up. It finds the individual colors that that stream of white light is made of. And I learned it in high school as Roy G. Biv. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. But alas, indigo got kicked off the color spectrum. So it's not just Roy G. Boo, you know, there, there's, no, there's no I in there anymore. And, yes, sir? I just found out that there's no color in the The temperature? Okay. Uh, now, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Okay, We are not the source of light. He did not say that. We're the prism. Now, if you shine a flashlight through the prism, it breaks it up into the spectrum. So you can see all the individual colors. The Lord did an ingenious thing. He does, he, he does that after every rain. 
I've never, if somebody can explain this to me, please feel free to explain it. But after it rains, there are gazillions of raindrops still in the air, right? So why isn't the entire sky just a bunch of little bitty rainbows? But it doesn't work that way. The Lord has designed it so it's a perfectly orderly bow of these colors, even in the, the exact order. And so here we are. We're the prisms. The Lord shines the light of the truth through us. And guess what our responsibility is? To split the truth of who God is up so that people can see who God is. Jesus said it, let your light so shine that others may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And the word glorify means to form a proper opinion. And so I am to so allow the truth of God's word to shine through me when it breaks it up and people can see how kind and gracious or wise or, or all the, the things that God is can be seen through our lives, then the world looks at us and says, oh, that's, oh, God's that good. God's that forgiving. God's this kind. God's that wise. God, and so we're the prisms. Now, light does five things when it strikes an object because not everything is a prism. But uh, the first thing that light does, it passes through. It just goes right through. A piece of clear glass. It just goes right through. Uh, the material it's transparent, it's clear, it's free of obstructions, and it allows the, the light to pass through in its totality. This is the believer whose life is clean before God. Then nothing stops it. Nothing breaks it up. Nothing obscures it. The second thing that happens, waves, light waves, can be reflected off of an object. For instance, light is being reflected off the pages of my Bible. It's being reflected off my arms, off the bench. It's being reflected. So everything you see, light is bouncing off of it. And as a matter of fact, uh, let's see. What color is this knot? You're exactly right. It's not black. It's every color but black. Now what happens is light hits this and absorbs every color except black black is bounced off and you see black and so black is the only color this is not and so uh you know not you don't have to absorb the light of the gospel they you ever talk to anybody it just bounced off of them they weren't interested i don't know look i i'm not interested in that don't talk to me about that and so there are some objects that it just bounces off of and they have no interest in the gospel whatsoever. Number three, waves can be scattered off of an object. Um, reflection can just bounce off a piece of bent metal. It's just going everywhere like uh, ping pong balls. And uh, James tells us about the double-minded man that's unstable in all of his ways. It's just uh, there's, uh, there's no consistency. There's no pattern. There's, he just, this is just an unfaithful believer. You never know what's going to happen in, in this guy's life. Uh, but one thing that you do know, it, there's not going to be any faithfulness in this guy's individual life. Now, you remember uh, Paul had to confront Peter? Why did he have to confront Peter? just inconsistent the light was just bouncing everywhere and Paul said you know I had to I had to confront the great apostle Peter he said, and the reason I had to do it when he was hanging out with the Gentiles he was all about the Gentiles then when the Jews came to town he was like uh oh gotta go gotta go gotta go and then he'd run over here and he'd, he'd buddy up with the Jews and treat the Gentiles like they were dogs Paul heard about it and he said I confronted him face to face with that inconsistent testimony the fourth thing that light does waves can be absorbed this object doesn't share what it receives it just absorbs it there's no passing it on 
Uh, there's no attempt to reflect the goodness and the, and the grace of the Lord. These people come to church and hear preaching. They'll hear message after message after message. They'll just absorb, just continually, just drink it in. But they will never share it with anybody. It's kind of like the Dead Sea. You know, you've got, you've got the Sea of Galilee up north in Israel, and you, then you've got the Jordan River, which is like a snake's back, and then you have the Dead Sea. And the reason that they call it the Dead Sea is because it is dead. Nothing lives, and the fish that are washed down from the Jordan River into the Dead Sea die within about six to eight minutes. There is no oxygen content in the Dead Sea, and they suffocate to death. The Dead Sea has the highest solid content of any body of water in the world. The content, the solid content of the Sea of, uh, or the Dead Sea is 30%. The average is about six of the world's oceans, which means it's basically liquid solid. You can get in the Dead Sea and float. You can't, it'd be hard to drown <laughs> in the Dead Sea. Uh, and so you can get in and you look like one of the little California sea otters. You're just bobbing up and down because of the, uh, of the salinity content in that thing. And so it, it doesn't, and the reason that it is dead, it doesn't, there are no outlets. There's no river leading out of the Dead Sea. The only way that the Dead Sea doesn't just overflow is because of evaporation. And evaporation takes all the water out, leaves the minerals, and it just gets saltier and saltier and saltier. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the Dead Sea has salt works built in it by the Jewish state. And it is a, well, it is the most valuable piece of water in the world. Keith gets potash from the Dead Sea. They buy potash from over there. And it is just, it's a bank. And, and they are making millions, millions of dollars. Uh, not Keith and them, but uh, the Jewish government and the folks that own those salt works. And so, you know the truth. And there are folks that just want to know more truth. They want to read more books. They want to listen to more Christian radio. Nothing wrong with that. You need that. But there needs to be an outlet. Okay? We can't just continually take in all of this information. And uh, then the, the fifth thing that is unusual about light, light can be refracted or bent. This object allows light to come in, but it goes out differently than when it entered. Have you ever taken a stick or something and stuck it down in water? Or your glass, you take your straw and put it down, and it goes in here. And Really? That was an illustration to show you that there are waves going on in this room. So, and so that, that's called the law of refraction. All right? And here's the application to that. Not everybody that receives the truth gives it out straight. There's a perversion of the Word of God in our culture. You know, they hear the truth, but when I've heard preachers that did not preach the truth. Now they read the same book that I, you know, they've got a King James Version Bible. But when they preach it, how can you take the Bible and preach that Jesus is not the Son of God? How can you do that? How can you preach that Jesus was an angel? Where do you get that? He was Michael the archangel. I mean, that, here, here's the truth, and here's the way it's coming out. That's called refraction or bending the truth. There's a lot of that going on in, in culture and so, now again, what did Jesus say? You are the light of the world. You're not the source of light, but you are the prismatic character through which the character of God is made visible. And the only way that light can be made visible is shining it through a prism. God has chosen, I don't know why, but God has chosen to limit himself to the use of human instrumentality. People can be as useful as they want to be. 
People can be as powerful in the hands of the Lord as they want to be. But then you can also just shut yourself off. You can, you can hear the truth and just keep building up all this and memorize scripture and all this stuff. And, and there's no outlet to it. Now, there are, there are three laws governing light. Three that we know of. And the, uh, well, before we get into that. Y'all know what lightning bugs are. Everybody in here, I, I love lightning bugs. And when I was a kid, we used to catch them, and we'd pop them, and we'd rub that stuff, and we'd play outside, and you could, you could see, you know. That stuff stinks to high heaven, but we'd, we'd play with that stuff rubbed all over our face. Um, did you know? That in the rear end of a lightning bug, in the caboose of a lightning bug, that little fella has a mixer. And that mixer mixes two chemicals. And when he mixes them, they glow. You know what the names of those chemicals are? Number one, there's a chemical called luciferous. And the second one, is luciferin who is the angel of light satan exactly now don't think that when, you, when we talk about satan that he is this grotesquely ugly ogre with blood dripping from his fangs that is not satan at all yeah if exactly if he walked in here physically tonight You'd want to meet him. Hey, how you, man, glad to have you. There would be absolutely no fear, no shock, because he hides behind truth. So don't be surprised when Satan is deeply involved in religious activity. He is an angel posing as light. And one of the, I, I just think it's a, a neat illustration is these two chemicals that mix together and boom all of a sudden you can you can see these things and um, but light is very obedient everything God has made functions by law I am so glad of that aren't you glad that gravity is consistent I'm glad that the laws of thermodynamics are consistent aren't you glad that the laws concerning um, uh, rain how about the sun the sun appears over here every morning i'm glad i don't have to guess maybe we'll have a southern sunrise we, we don't know uh you know we're 93 million miles from the sun i'm glad it stays at 93 million miles i'm glad that it doesn't you know move a little closer just see what's going on i'm glad it doesn't do that because it burn everything to a crisp so god's laws are repetitive they are consistent. They are regular. That's why they're called laws. They're not theories. It is not the theory of gravity or the theory of thermodynamics. It is the law of thermodynamics. And these laws make statements that make other things false. For instance, if I was talking with an atheist and he was proposing to me evolution, I could simply go, and you could too, you go to the second law of thermodynamics. It is a highly theological law. And that law says that the usable energy in any system is being continually degraded. In other words, we're running out of batteries. Things are going worse. The earth is wobbling on its axis. If you take one of these tops you know, when you spin that top for just a few minutes, it won't move. It'll just spin. And, but what happens when gravity begins to impact that top? It'll start doing this, all right? Um, have you looked at your high school graduation picture lately? Uh, you know what I'm talking about? And, you know, I can, I can look at those old pictures and, and be like, who is that, you know? It, we've, we've changed <laughs> exactly. we've changed what's happening 
the second law of thermodynamics says we are running out of energy. And of course, as you run out of energy, gravity also affects other things, you know, and so it, it just, it changes. And so here are some, here are some laws of light. Number one, light travels in a straight line, travels in a straight line. We, it's, it's missional. Light is on a mission. Ed Brown used to tell me he was fast. And I say, Ed, how fast are you? He say, Jim, I'm so fast. I can turn the light off and be in bed before it gets dark. And I was like, wow, now that is fast. That is fast. And, uh, but light travels in a straight line. It knows what it needs to do, and it gets there in a hurry. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. You know, I think there's a lot of Christians just don't know what they're doing in life. They're just, they're just kind of meandering, you know. They're living life, they're having fun, uh, make a little money, and, you know, they just, but, but as far as being on a mission, so what if, what if you turned your flashlight on or your lights and the light just started It'll, it'll get to you after a while, you know, but it's kind of like, uh, y'all remember Tim Conway on the Carol Burnett show, how, the old man, you know, he'd shuffle, and, and I saw him one, I laughed, he fell down the steps, the old man, the old man, and he, it was slow motion, he fell down, and, and Harvey Corman and Carol Burnett were at the bottom of the stairs, and they could not stand it. Harvey Corman was just chewing a hole in the side of his mouth. And that, that reminds me, Jesus said, you're the light of the world. All right, we'll be there after a while, you know, and it just takes us forever to get somewhere with the gospel, all right? Travels in a straight line. It doesn't exist randomly. Number two, the further you are from the source of the light, the dimmer that light gets. The source is Christ. The further you are from Him, the dimmer that becomes. Um, stay, stay close to the source. That um, you have, oh, I got a watch that's got these little dots on it and things on the uh, on the hands and it's phosphorescent is that the term yeah and i can take my flashlight fluorescent. Yeah, fluorescent. yeah fluorescent yeah fluorescent and i can shine it on that watch for a few seconds and then turn it off i can tell what time it is it'd just be dark as a tomb but i can tell what time it is now it doesn't last long it's got to constantly be regenerated you can't do it one time and it lasts. You, being Christian, I think it's important that you be in this assembly as often as you can. Now, no, we can't be here every time. I'm not unreasonable enough to think that you need to drag in here sick and coughing. Uh, you know, there are times where you just need to go on vacation. You need to do that. I'm aware of that. Everybody in here, and, and I've, I've talked with preachers before, and, and they're bragging, well, I ain't, had a, I ain't had a vacation in 18 years. And I'm thinking, well, you've been an idiot for 18 years. You really have. You need some time away. And, if, and your wife does, you know. And so y'all here, y'all need to go somewhere and, and just relax and, you know, recharge. You need to do that. But um, stay in God's will. Everybody has a purpose. And your decision is not your decision. It is your discovery. Your purpose is not your decision. Well, what do I want to be? What, what, you know, what do I want to be in life? That's not your decision. That's already been decided. See, God knows why he put you here. And there is an assignment to your life. When you get saved, there is a purpose for your life. My purpose, then, is to discover, Lord, what do you want me to be? And so, you know, don't ask a kid, what do you want to be when you grow up? The wrong question to ask. The right question to ask is, what does God want you to be? And then you guide them toward the, uh, the purpose that, that God has designed for their life. And so the further you are from the source of light, I, I read uh, an illustration one time. There was a, an old man that just had just quit going to church. And the pastors of the churches had gone by to see him and they'd get on to him and, you know, just you know, nag him and, and he just, just wouldn't listen to him. New pastor comes to town and they called a new guy 
and he makes his obligatory visit, you know, to this old gentleman's home that, that just quit coming to church years ago. And it was, it was in the wintertime, and it was cold. And he knocks on the door, and the old man invites him in, and you got the fireplace going, and the fire just roaring, and it's warm, and the coals are glowing hot, and the preacher just sits down and never says a word. And he takes one of the fireplace pokers, and he reaches in the fire, and he drags out one of those coals out onto the hearth and puts the poker down and just sits back and never says a word. And they sit there, and the preacher watches that coal as it gets colder and colder, and pretty soon it's black. And the old man looked at him, and he said, I'll see you Sunday. That you need to stay close to the source. There's nothing magic about being here. This is a building. That's all this is. This is not the house of God. Don't call this building the house of God. That is an Old Testament phrase that was true of the tabernacle. It is not true of this building. You know where the house of God is? You are the temple. You are where the Lord dwells and lives. And so, number two, the further you are from the source of light, the dimmer the light gets. Number three, the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of refraction. In other words, I'll give you an illustration. I, I, illustrations make things simple for me, so excuse me if I use a bunch, but it helps me understand because there's a lot of stuff that's hard for me. I played baseball at Winter Haven High School, and I played shortstop. And I always had trouble when a throw was coming in from the outfield pretty fast. If it bounced in front of me, you know, you just you turn your head and, and just hope. You know, you just hope it hit something, and usually it did. Uh, and I had a coach uh, named Ed or, or uh, Whitney. He was Brother Whitney's cousin or uh, anyway was kin to Ed Whitney over at Westwood best baseball coach I ever had and he got us infielders one together one time and he said guys let me let me help you with something here when you are fielding a throw from the outfield and it's coming in and you know it's going to bounce he said here's the way you can catch it every time he said put your glove on the ground and so we'd put our glove on the ground so you don't put it up here you put it on the ground you look at the angle that the ball is coming in on. As soon as that ball hits the ground, you pull your glove up to that angle. And you know what? The old guy was right. It got to where I look forward to throws coming in from the outfield. Because you look good catching them. You know, it was just like... Now, if, if the ball is coming in like this and, you know, you don't pull it up, high enough or you pull it too high you look like an idiot you know I mean the ball is just going off to the third base and you know but yeah the angle the angle of incidence was equal to the angle of refraction and treat people the way you want to be treated the angle of your treatment determines the angle of your treatment does that make sense how you treat other people, what you plant in other people, is what you're going to harvest from their life. And so, um, I, I've talked with people through the years that uh, say things like, I just don't have enough time. I just, I just I need another four hours in the day. No, you don't. I hear people say, I, I, I've read books and I've, I've seen time management seminars you, you ever seen those you know you don't manage time what do you manage you you man yeah I don't care what you do to time you got 24 hours I need to manage me because I can I can waste time you ever wasted any time and once it's gone it's gone right and so if if I need something in my life, that's the thing I need to plant. I just wish people were kinder to me. 
Really. I just wish people were more patient with me. Hmm. Can I give you a suggestion? What you need is what you need to plan. You need people to be more patient with you? Might I suggest you plant patience? It's the law of the harvest, folks. You plant tomato seeds, don't be shocked if tomatoes come up. If you want tomatoes and you plant cucumbers, be shocked when cucumbers come up. Well, I thought it was tomatoes. No, you planted cucumbers. And so the law of the harvest, not only agriculturally but spiritually, is really pretty simple. Number one, you reap what you sow. That's, and that's, that's how people become successful farmers. You need peaches, you plant peaches. You need peppers, might I suggest you plant peppers. It's really pretty simple. Well, I need people to be more of this to the, plant that. Plant it. All right, so you reap what you sow. Number two, you reap more than you sow. You plant a watermelon seed, for instance. One seed. You're going to get one vine. How many watermelons will be on that one vine? Four, five, something like that. How many seeds are in each watermelon? How many seeds did you plant? One. How many seeds you got on your hand? Hundreds. See, you reap more than you sow. But you reap later than you sow. Plant a watermelon seed on Tuesday. Guess what you ain't going to eat Thursday? Not, not watermelon off of that, you know, not off of that one. It's going to take a while. So as we, as we plant kindness and patience and mercy and love and forgiveness see these are these are seeds that are refracted through our lives because this is what God is and the moment you need these things in your life guess what they'll be there the Lord will have for you the patience that you've planted, the kindness that you've planted, it, it'll be there. I'm just telling you. Now, that's not why. You're, you're not kind to people because you want people to be kind to you. you. We do this because it's the right thing to do. You know, you love people not because you'll get something for it. You love people because God loved you without cause. Without cause. Um, and so, going back, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And often we read these analogies and we read this stuff and we just run right by it. Yeah, we're the light of the world. woo You know, and we just run on and, and we don't grasp what is being said. If we're light, there's something to that. We need to investigate light. If, if we're salt, we need to investigate salt and see exactly what he's talking about. And um, so this world needs who you are. And, and you just... You don't know how valuable you are. You re- we don't know until we don't have it. If the power went off in the building, you, you, well, when we have a hurricane, you can count on it. The, the, lights, the power's going to go off, and that which you took for granted, now you, you just wish you had, oh, my goodness, we just... I just need some light. And so you go light the candles or, or do whatever you do. And um, so I'm, I'm grateful that God Almighty, the light of the world, the light source of the world, has chosen us. You know, he, he could have called the redwood trees in California to preach the gospel. My, what a voice. What about the Rockies? What if the Rocky Mountains were evangelists? Look at the voice that they could have. What about the Pacific Ocean? What if every molecule of water in the Pacific Ocean was called to preach? Oh, my word. What about the air? What if he called every molecule of oxygen to preach? You think it might be more effective than us? I think probably so. But he didn't. And I think it's marvelously mysterious to me 
that the only form of life that deliberately rebelled against him in the Garden of Eden is the only form of life that he has called to be the lights of the world. He's given us an opportunity to be what Adam refused to be in the Garden of Eden, but the Lord said, I will restore that. I will offer you an opportunity to be redeemed, to be saved, to be born again. What a privilege it is to be a prism so that the world can see who God is through us. So though when they see our good works, they come to know who the Lord is through everything we do. So you're the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill can't be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine that men may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. To other people. Good good illustration. Good illustration. What time is it? Eight o'clock. Thank y'all for being here. I appreciate your presence tonight. And uh, hope you have a wonderful week. See you Sunday morning. Be here at uh, ten o'clock for Sunday school and then uh, Richard's going to be playing at 11 o'clock. Then we've got lunch, uh, soup and salad fundraiser. So hang around and get some of that. So I always love this soup and salad thing. And uh, then be back to also Sunday night at 6 o'clock. We're going to be in Ezekiel. I think it's 28, if I'm not mistaken, chapter 28. And, uh, boy, hadn't this been a journey through the book of Ezekiel? Did y'all know the book of Ezekiel was like that? Man, um, deep graphic is, is the word I was looking for. It's just like, whoa, whoa. So anyway, um, we'll be in chapter, I think it's 27. He certainly does. <laughs> Sometimes he tells it more than like it is. You know? And uh, anyway, all right, God bless you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Lord, we're grateful for your goodness. Thank you for these great analogies and illustrations that are, they're real. They're real. They are part of the world in which we live, so clear, so graphic, so illustrative, and so convicting. Light gets everywhere quicker than we do, and Lord, we are to be missional in the way we live our lives, intentional in the way we live our lives, not just randomly living until we die, but living on purpose, living to a goal, and that is to reveal the glory of God to our culture. And uh, we're grateful for your goodness. In Christ's name I pray, amen.